to work in a wee deli in Belfast. Um, I've been working there for sort of four years, and I like to call it my accidental market research. More and more people were sort of coming in, like looking for local produce and stuff like that. And one thing that we didn't have up in Northern Ireland was anyone making small scale raw milk farmhouse cheeses, you know, sort of. That was my accidental market research, and I started writing a blog about cheese called One Man and His Cheese, and it was that idea of like trying to find out the story behind cheeses that would help you to, to sell them. And um, that's whenever I came across a course at the School of Artisan Food, which is down in Welbeck State in Nottinghamshire, um, and just decided it was a I'd go away, learn how to make cheese with the idea of someday moving back to Northern Ireland and starting to make uh, raw milk cheeses. Um, it was on that course where I met Andy and we were doing uh, a couple of modules with us and stuff like that. And it's been pretty cool starting our businesses at pretty much the same time and stuff like that and um, yeah, being able to sort of have that support uh, whenever we were starting and having those sort of first batches. The course School of Arts and Food went and made the uh, Spark and Hole, did that for a year um, with David and Joe sort of again try and learn as much as I could. Became a bit of a dairy pervert where I, when I, at the weekends when I wasn't making cheese with David and Joe, I would sort of uh, go around and ask people can I work for you and come and see your dairy and stuff like that. Um, so did that for a year and then moved back to Northern Ireland quite arrogantly thinking I've got all these great connections, um, I know how to make cheese now, the banks are going to be <laughs> falling over each other to give me all the money I need to, uh, <laughs> to get it started, but yeah, uh, I think I was like 26, 27 at the time and didn't quite work out like that. Uh, it was at this stage I moved back in sort of September 2012 and told everyone I was coming back to make cheese and I was starting to get there around Christmas time and hadn't even, <laughs> hadn't even started uh, <laughs> the, the basics of it yet, so um, that's when we came across a thing called Cedars, it's like an online dragon den. Um, and basically you sort of, it's a sophisticated way of raising a lot of money. Your friends can put in 10, 20, 100 pounds, um, or if there's also larger investors in it. So we raised 80,000 pounds um, through Cedars and that was for our initial setup. We were sort of fitting out a, a unit with um, sort of the least amount of equipment and stuff that we needed. Um, and then also the first sort of four or five months running cost. Made uh, young buck was, was sort of I didn't know what type of cheese that I wanted to make or, or why. Again, a lot of cheese makers do it because of like a, a region or the cheese is traditional to there. For us in Northern Ireland, there's no history of raw milk cheese making at all. All I did was they sort of if you look back, there was things a bit of putrefied butter in the bogs or something like that, wasn't it? You know, so um, didn't think that the <laughs> people's palates were ready for that. Um, so again, it was like talking to people like Andy, um, trying to find a cheese that you know I could have a mature cheddar where I was going to be aging it for you know a year, two years, because one we didn't have the space, two I didn't have the sort of time to be waiting on, on turnovers, something like that. Again, we couldn't do uh, a soft cheese or something that was going to ripen really quickly. Um, again, because we didn't think we'd be able to sell that much of it that quickly at the start. So again. I sort of worked around a few places and just uh, I'd worked with Joe Schneider at Stitzelton for a bit. Uh, I'd approached uh, him with the idea of doing it and he'd be welcoming of that and stuff, and that was great. And then he ended up chatting to Andy and he was saying, Raw milk blue, if you could make a raw milk blue that's tasty and consistent, then it'd be something that could be a go works. Again, the UK at that time, there didn't seem to be many. But yeah. So we made our first batch in November 2013. And sold the first on the first of March, and again at this stage we're behind, and it's great to have people like Andy who uh, sort of probably is the reason we're still making cheese. We were sort of getting a bit thin on the old cash, and it was great sort of paying for cheese before we'd even <laughs> sent it and made it over to him and stuff like that. You get that sort of honest feedback as well from Andy. You know, it's great sort of you've been sort of being you know, given bits to your family, and your friends, and they're like, oh yeah, that's great, that's great, and then. I think you've got it all sorted and it's like, you got to do this, you got to do this, you got to do this. Well, again, but that's, that's what you want as a cheese maker and that makes us <coughs> a better cheese maker selling our cheese to someone like Andy. Um, we go and get that. So that's pretty, pretty much our story. Based on an old Stilton recipe, um, there's a sort of old cheese making book from 1916 where 
Uh, we would reference, again, Joe Stitchelton. He had, um, what's your name? Uh, the last guy to make raw milk Stilton for Colston Bassett helped <coughs> Stitchelton with their recipe. So then Joe sort of passed on a bit of that. But again, it's from this like, old book from like, 1916 called Practical Cheese Making. Um, and yeah, so you've just got to convert drams and things like that into, <laughs> into millimeters. But once you're over that, then you're fine, you know? Um, so that's kind of where we started the BSR recipe on. Um, and again, whenever we first started, that was our whole thing. We wanted, we wanted to be, we wanted Young Buck to be a sketch of you know. I sort of loved their cheese making process. I loved their cheese. Um, so we sort of did everything we could to try and replicate that. But as we have found over time, our recipes changed, and it's changed to sort of fit in with the milk. So whenever we're making our cheese, again. All the cheese, like all Tom's cheese, all my cheese, they're all sort of made in the same way where you got your milk, your cultures, and your molds, your rennet, and your salt. And it's just what you, at what stage you add these things, at, at what quantities, and how you manipulate the curd depends on the different types and textures and flavors and stuff of cheese that you want to get. Um, so, whenever we're um, acidifying our curd, so again, cheese making, you're trying to preserve the milk. You're taking all the solids and then you're doing what you can to preserve them. So things like acidifying it, dropping the acid to make, so you can keep it, adding salt, taking out moisture. Again, as you acidify it, that also takes out the moisture. Uh, we have a real long process. So like cheddar, they'll have the milk, the cheese will be in the press by the end of the day sort of with your base cheese. Whenever we uh, are making young buck, we get the milk in the morning. Um, we'll sort of set the curd, cut it, separate it into the curd and whey take off our whey uh, and then we'll ladle the curd from the vat into the drain table and then we leave that there overnight. So that's sitting, draining, acidifying, getting sort of early ferments going and that's sort of what causes whenever it's good for it to be really good but then also you're sort of, uh, you're at whim of uh, the milk at this stage. Uh, again, we've been making the milk for just over a year with our current milk supply so we're sort of just about getting into the seasonality of that because again, that's going to be changing daily, if not seasonally, whenever the cows coming in and out and what they're eating. Um, and again, it's just sort of learning your milk. And so we're just letting the curd do what it can. We have a few sort of key points when we'll do a certain process to try and get it to some sort of consistency. Um, and that's sort of what sets our cheese out from, from others. Again, it's that sort of slow food mentality of you just sort of you get really good raw product and just let it sort of sing. You don't want to try and put too much mold in it so it's really blue. You don't want to try and put too much salt in it so it's really salty. Listening to um, Randolph Hodgson talk about like a, a, his sort of memories of what a raw milk stilton was like. And he said it's that sort of three in one cheese where you're getting the cheese being broke down from the inside from the blue mold, but again that's the very last thing that happens and it doesn't have to be a lot through if you just like find little nuggets of real nice little intense blue. But then it's also being broken down from the, the outside in and you're getting that like you get on a wash wine cheese, lots of like yeast and mold and starting to sort of go that sort of maybe not pink as such, but you, you know, sort of like dark yellow, like you'd have a, a cafilli or something like that, where you've got it sort of crumbly, that sort of difference and like biscuity flavors and stuff like that. So again, like that's what we try and do. Our rinds are a bit wetter. Like a lot of skeletons would have sort of a powdery, dry rind, uh, and while ours are a bit wetter and a bit more wild, we hopefully that's what we're. Our end goal is to have that sort of consistent, not dry, not wet rind, where it's sort of breaking it, the cheese down for you from the outside.